of uh, family engagement, I would say that what we would typically see um, in a school setting at least, uh, we would have parent meetings, parent assemblies, emails, um, different apps that teachers like to use, electronic communication like Class Dojo, um, Remind apps, those are some of the newer things. Um, we're all used to having like parent assemblies and, and mailing information home, um, homework lines, um, parent teacher conferences, volunteering um, opportunities like uh, attending athletic events. Those are all different types of um, parental involvement that we're used to seeing. Um, I will preface that, you know, for most people, they have an idea of what parental involvement is or family engagement is, and it's pretty narrow. So there's a lot more to it. Um, and in my dissertation, I looked at Epstein's model and there were six different types. But when we think of different ways of families engaging, um, you know, the traditional things that we think about, those are types of parental involvement. But, you know, even things that are as small as checking grades, um, just having a good learning environment at home, um, just the phone calls, um, things like that that you wouldn't normally um, associate as being um, involvement and engagement, those can also be different types of involvement. So, um, there are a lot of different ways for the school and the community and parents to, to form that um, engagement. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so you mentioned the Epstein's um, six different kinds of involvement. Um, a lot of students that I have will come in and think parents aren't involved. And it's partially because they have an idea that parental involvement means a certain thing. What are some ways that your uh, study of Epstein's model helped you kind of make that view bigger? Well, just knowing some of the different ways that parents can be involved. So parenting is, is considered a form of engagement. So making sure that your child is ready to, to learn, making sure that they have enough rest, they have enough um, nutrition, um, having a good setup at home. Um, even that communication. Um, I, would, I would have thought before, um, if a parent's not showing up for meetings, if they're not showing up you know, for school functions, if they don't always participate in fundraisers or volunteer, that they're not as engaged as another parent. But they might be um, just as engaged, but in ways that aren't as obvious. So if they are making sure that you know, their children have all the things that they need at home to learn, like a nice space and all the materials and, um, you know, emailing teachers and um, maybe serving on like a PTO or PTA um, or even, you know, doing career fairs or just, you know, setting things up and um, maybe not necessarily being visible with their engagement um, they can still be very, very much engaged in their child's education. So just knowing the different types of ways that parents can be involved in um, their child's education really helped me realize, like, just because I don't see a parent doing something doesn't mean that they're not fully engaged. Mm -hmm. No, that's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up. What are... Uh... What are some things you've seen um, in your research that seem kind of more innovative, um, maybe outside the box that, that you researched? Probably uh, the thing that I liked the most, and I have a bias since I have a mental health background, but I really liked, um, it was a school-based school -based health um, partnerships that uh, you would have like, um, mental health, you would have like doctors or nurse practitioners, um, you would have all of those services available inside of a school and it would serve as a center for parents and students and everyone in that community to be able to access those resources through the school. And um, 
I mean, we do have some in Tennessee, and I know that they do actually have um, one in Knox County yeah. where you have, um, you know, the different, um, I think there's like a, um, a nursing school that, offer, that offers all of those services, and it's inside of a public school. So I think those are really um, neat resources because you can give parents the um, psychoeducational materials to help with like nutrition, to help with learning, um, you know, therapy, uh, some of those resources that wouldn't necessarily be available through the school system, but are through um, other community systems that could kind of come in and help. Um, and it's just like a whole, a whole system approach. And I really think that that's neat that that's readily available to parents in one place. So I thought that was really cool. Are there any approaches that you saw that you just, you just thought they were terrible? Like that you almost like maybe laughed or, or were kind of offended or anything? <laughs> I think the worst approach is to not have a purposeful approach to parental engagement. Um, I think that most schools and school systems engage in some way but it might be in a haphazard way. Uh -huh. And it's not with intentionality. Um, probably one of the worst things you can do is to send out information and to have a one-sided conversation with parents. Where if you're just emailing and you're mailing things home and you're not soliciting any feedback from stakeholders, that's probably the worst thing because you don't really know what their needs are. Mm -hmm. And you might have um, needs in a diverse population that aren't being addressed because you're just sending out information, but you're not receiving any. So you can't adjust what you're doing if you don't have any feedback. Yeah, it sounds a little bit like teaching without assessing. Right? right? Teaching, 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 and you're not actually checking to see what your students know or need to know. You're not really doing your job, right? Right. Okay. Agreed. So um, some of the, those traditional methods, uh, one of the things that we'd said we might talk about is why sometimes some of those traditional methods don't work so well, particularly when there's a family living in poverty or across racial lines or with families with students with special needs. Could you comment on that? And maybe you can kind of use that to kind of get into your dissertation research? Sure. Um, so some of the ways that um, schools typically engage parents, you know, with the parent meetings, the emails, things that are very generic, um, they can be exclusionary. So, you know, for families that are in poverty or they maybe live in rural area, areas, um, they might not have access to internet, they might not have access to devices, um, it might be hard for them to access um, all the electronic things that you're sending home um, and asking them to print off materials, assuming that they have things that you're asking of them. Um, and they might not have those things because they can't afford those things or they're just not readily available to them. So that's an issue. Um, and also, you know, with, with families that are diverse, um, there's always the language issue. Um, a lot of, we have a lot of families that English isn't their first language. So if you're only sending things home that are in one language, um, that's exclusionary. Um, for some families of color, um, education is kind of, the, the school has been kind of a divi divisive um, entity and there's always kind of been a conflict there. So if you're only sending information one way, um, it could come across in a tone that you're not, you're not intending. It could come across as like condescending. So you really have to engage in a different way, in a more community-based way, in a more personable way, um, just to kind of reach families that have not always had um, positive experiences with school. Um, and that's kind of been, it's kind of been a history that I did look at a little bit in my research, um, especially with students with disabilities that are also students of color with disabilities. 
um, they get they get punished more, they, they get suspended more. Um, so those families, you have to understand that some families have a different experience with schools. So you have to approach them in a different way if you want to get their support. And getting that buy-in um, on the front end is really important. So maybe trying a different tactic that you wouldn't necessarily try with um, every family and just recognizing like who your families are. We talked a little bit um, in class this semester and last semester about welcome letters. And we looked at them trying to think carefully, uh, how would this be received by different types of families? And uh, it's fun, you know, you can just search and find letters with a Google image search. And so you can just grab them and start analyzing. Um, and that, that was a fun exercise we did. Um, is that the, is the letter home still, you think kind of like one of the number one initial approaches, like you say, to kind of get the foot in the door, so to speak? It can be. Um, I mean, you, you do have to have some communication and, and obviously, you know, letters and emails, like you have to continue doing that. Um, I purposefully try to send things in multiple languages in, in home. Um, if I send something that's electronic that I know um, a parent might speak a different language, I will include like a translation, um, a link for a translation so that they can have a translation. Um, for parents with special needs students, um, a lot of times when you when you receive those letters, your first thought is, but does this apply to me? Because there are just so many things that um, are different for parents and special needs students, which was my focus for my dissertation. So making sure in the language that everyone knows that everyone is welcome and this applies to everyone, that's also, I think, very important. In your, uh, in your opinion, and maybe the research, uh, one of the questions I kind of bat around in my head is, what's better, being explicit or being vague? So if you're vague, you could say all families. And you could just capital, you could do all caps and underline all. Mm -hmm. Or you could be specific. You could say families with students with disabilities families with students with gender identity, families, you could do this whole list, families of varying religious backgrounds. Did you see anything in, in the research about kind of, is there kind of a better approach? And then, and what about your opinion on that matter? Um, I recall for families, special needs students specifically, um, having that, that um, be reaching out to those families specifically so that they know that they specifically, um, this applies to them or this does not apply to them. Um, and every, every parent that has a child with a disability should have like a case manager. So um, having that point of contact and having that person say, welcome and you know, this is what applies and this is, is you know, don't worry about this. But in terms of vague versus specific, that's very difficult. I think if you were an administrator and you were sending something out to an entire school, an entire family, vague might be better um, because you never know who you might forget mm -hmm. and accidentally exclude. Um, and then for the people that have special populations that they're responsible for communicating with, they need to communicate with those special populations specifically so that those parents know that this vague statement does or does not apply to me. I, in my opinion, I think that would probably be better. One of the things I think that, that I'm hearing kind of behind what you're saying is that one size fits all 
it doesn't have to be the way because you've got a whole school community that's working right. with the whole parental community. Absolutely, yes. A lot so, of young teachers, you know, sorry, a lot of young teachers come in and think it's all on them and I'm going to be the teacher that is kind of the one that's going to do it all. And um, They sometimes forget that they're going to enter into a system that has varying degrees of support for them and varying things that might they might see as barriers. Mm -hmm. It's always important to have a team. You are not an island unto yourself. And um, even in that partnership with the parent, they're part of that team. Mm -hmm. So every, every student, every family, you're on a team with them. And the more people that are able to help you on that team, the better. Um, you would never see any, I mean, you might have stars on a sports team, but they're still part of a team. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if you don't have the answer for something, um, there should always be someone in that system. And it might be, um, it might be another teacher, it might be an administrator, it might be a community member that's able to help with that. Um, but it's always important to think outside of your classroom. We, we didn't, I didn't prep you on this one, but it just occurred to me if you can think of anything, if anything comes to mind, are there some common mistakes that you've seen beginning teachers make? Maybe aside from some of the things you've already mentioned um, in terms of parental engagement and particularly parental engagement when the students are uh, have special needs? Uh, yes. So I would probably say the first, the first mistake is coming in thinking that, that there might be an adversarial uh, relationship there or that parents are even a hurdle mm -hmm. that they have to, to cross. Um, I would always say going into any um, relationship, just assume positive intentions. So, you know, you might have a parent that is upset or is angry or you might be upset or angry with a student or you're not understanding a situation if you can reframe your mindset to assume positive intentions they might be upset for a reason but always remember that um, they have the best interests of their child and if you can assure them that you do as well um, that would help with that partnership mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that um, probably the biggest hurdle um, is feeling like parents are adversaries versus partners. And I see that a lot with um, special needs families because the meetings that you have are so formal with IEP or uh, 504 meetings and they can be very intimidating and parents can feel intimidated because they might not understand everything that's happening and you know, first year teachers might feel very nervous because they're scared they might make a mistake, mm -hmm. um, but really feeling like, okay, these are my partners in this child's education and knowing that uh, we all have the best interests of this child in mind and we're here to work together for that goal and we have a common goal. I think that's probably the thing that's going to help them grow the most, I would say. Cool. Yeah, that's good. I know as a first year teacher, I was like intimidated and uh, like nervous. And, and I definitely, even though I felt like I had a pretty good, I had a master's program that was kind of a, like, get your license while you're teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, I felt like they did a pretty good job on some pedagogy. Here's how you do it. But I don't recall any kind of like, you need to always assume that this is a partnership. Uh, and so I went into it very much with the kind of like adversarial, like, you know, I'm young, these people are older than me. Mm -hmm. I've got, I've got the, the dog helping us out here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and always, uh, always wait before you send an email and have someone proofread it. <laughs> 
I learned that lesson the hard way for sure. <laughs> Not even with parents, with colleagues. I think that's a good that's a good life skills lesson right there. <laughs> yeah, always wait. You have 24 hours to respond. That's right. Do not fire off an email. Change your life. Today when you are tired. <laughs> yeah. Good. But is there anything uh, else that you'd share you'd want kind of new teachers to know based on what you learn in your research or kind of your own experience? Um. I mean, I would say that um, the, most, the most important thing I learned was that it was really, you know, just engage families. You are not, you're not alone in this. You really are part of a team. And the more um, you can draw from other resources because everyone can't do everything and everyone can't know everything, but there are other families, there are other resources that might specialize in something that you don't know. Um, you can maybe teach, um, you know, about Latinx history, but um, it might be better to have someone in the community come in and demonstrate something, and that might be more effective. And it could be a parent, um, or even like a career fair, something like that. Like you are just not, you can't do everything. And um, being able to forge those relationships with people and to have a partnership with people and allowing other people to come in and help will ultimately help you help your students better. Yeah, it sounds like a uh, win-win as you describe that. As I think about, like, on the one hand, you are showing students that one person doesn't have to know it all. So that's good modeling. You're showing the importance of connection, as you say, right? And as you're showing the importance of community connection, you're showing respect for members of your community which therefore could build more trust with your students. Um, so yeah, that, that's great. That's really good advice. Um, I, I appreciate that. Now, uh, is there something else that I can... <laughs> Is there anything else that you can think of or you, you feel like that's pretty good? I think that's pretty good. Maybe, ro maybe rolling with the unexpected. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like, 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 a, like, do you want to share about your rolling with the unexpected last semester uh, or last spring with the dissertation? Sure. Are they, is everyone allowed to know like where I'm from now? Kind of. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, it's always good to be flexible and um, to be measured and calm. I don't think that anyone would ever in, encounter um, a situation where I did. So for that, you know, you should be grateful. Um, so, <laughs> so um, my, I was towards the end of my dissertation. I had, um, I was in the last chapters. I only had to conduct my focus groups. I'd already done all the interviews. It was just focus groups. And I remember that I was going to finish that up on the Tuesday um, when we got back to our campus because there weren't going to be any students in the building that day. And uh, that was all set up. Monday night, tornadoes came through and uh, destroyed our building. It is destroyed. It is no more. So that was that was a thing. Uh, so we're at home, and we finally formulate a plan as a county to um, come back to school. And right now we're on that plan. Actually, my school is in a school with two different schools. So there's three schools within one school. So 
I'm like, okay, that's fine. And I had plans with um, the people that needed to do the focus group on what we were going to do. And then uh, the pandemic happened and those plans got canceled as well. And there was no more school. And so we couldn't do our focus groups in person. So I was starting to panic a little bit because I'm like, how am I supposed to actually finish my dedication if I can't finish my focus groups? Uh, I'm like, okay, okay, we can, we can figure this out. So I've, I did my focus groups via Zoom. Uh, my participants were very gracious and I felt very bad asking them, I know we're in the middle of a pandemic and I know our building just, just got destroyed and everything that you've accumulated in your teaching years has been gone. But would you mind having a focus group for me? But they were very gracious and they were very, and they were willing to help. So I really do appreciate them for that. And uh, so, yeah, I don't think anyone's ever gonna have to encounter any type of obstacle like that, but that's why having relationships with people is very important because if I had, <laughs> if I had to ask a stranger to um, really help out with a focus group, I probably wouldn't have gotten any, any responses, but yeah. Yeah, that's good. So as in research goes teaching. <laughs> yeah. Stuff happens. It happens. I don't think the unpredictable happens quite like that, no. but um, everyone's, everyone's had to uh, be in the pandemic and had to adjust their lives accordingly. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I guess there's a lot of double whammies out there right now for people in terms of we've got the pandemic and we got a death in the family, we got a pandemic. Yeah. Y'all got pandemic plus tornado plus a death in the family plus all the other stuff that people always have to deal with. Dog, yeah. The dog howling in the middle of your, your Zoom interview. <laughs> um, so. All right, good. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to stop the recording. Uh, and yeah, that was great. Thank you so much.